So you want to understand the world you live in. You want to know how exactly in 2022 we find our American society facing every single type of terrible assault on our constitutional rights every single day and growing worse, where we are lied to by our leaders and our media, where systemic corruption runs rampant and nothing seems to make any sense anywhere and everywhere you look? How did such a bleak situation come into being? Most people agree that our governmental system came up from a history of great men like Jefferson, Washington, Franklin, and others. If you want to learn and grow from knowing truth, you must understand history. I'm not talking history as written by the winners of conflicts of human will over many diverse circumstances, but truly understanding history. It takes you becoming active in researching and analyzing complex and sometimes conflicting historical information. As valuable a research tool as Google search is and other search engines may be, they do not let the seeker of information off the hook from using their own intellect to weigh information accurately. It's hardly contested that our current history books are filled with purposeful inaccuracy, lies, distortions, and half-truths. I took the heavy approach in the introduction of this documentary to shake out of this subject the faint of heart, the apathetic and weak-minded who don't or won't look at complex issues. And the goal of this video is to make you use your own God-given ability to weigh out information, to think for yourself. It won't be comfortable. It will force you to look at truth. The issue of the assassination of John F. Kennedy is more often than not made out to look like an endless hall of mirrors, trap doors, and false trails. The most important first thing that you must do at this point is to stop this video, go to my YouTube page, and follow and look at all the videos about this subject matter. The link is here. Spend a week, a month, a year, or whatever you need to do to watch all of the videos I posted on this subject. I have been careful to avoid any JFK assassination research videos I feel use confused or false information in order to help you on your quest. Number one, there was a massive conspiracy, a coup to remove JFK from office. Two, there was a massive cover-up by the government to hide the fact of this. Three, there's been a decades-long conspiracy to hide this fact by the national media and the government agencies. Four, there was an extreme effort to frame Lee Harvey Oswald as the lone gunman. While I will be sharing certain facts about the assassination itself that you may or may not be aware, my goal here is not to convince you that a conspiracy occurred. If you watched even just a few videos I pointed you to, or perhaps saw the JFK Oliver Stone film, and you used your brain, then the avalanche of the truth buffet you were served should have left you without a doubt. Since it is well known since the 1960s, well over 70% of society does not believe the Warren Report. There is no doubt society and a great majority already know this is truth, which says something about society. I'm not going to discuss in any way the question of shooters, magic bullets, nor am I going to tell you your facts are wrong and mine are right and why, because that's a fool's errand, and it's not my purpose here. My purpose is to get you to think. While I do believe the JFK assassination to be the most tragic event in our country's history, at the same time, there have been a limited number of major heroes and minor individuals who took great risks to research and expose the subject to people since the 60s. And these heroes to me are the most gallant and heroic and important people in the history of this country. More so than all of the movie stars, rock stars, athletes, and all the entertainers who ever lived piled up together times 1,000. That's how important I believe these people are. If some names you've never heard of in this research community, if you're over the age of 30, shame on you. If you're under, well, this is the point of this video. Oliver Stone was extremely correct when he says it's up to you and nothing is more important. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read 
Jim Garrison's closing argument from the Clay Shaw trial, so you can hear what he said exactly from start to finish. You should listen to the words, reflect, learn. The court. Do I understand, Mr. Garrison, you wish to address the jury? Mr. Garrison, yes. May it please the court, gentlemen of the jury. I'm not going to dignify Mr. Diamond's personal inferences about my staff because I think you've seen them for some days and I think you've seen me here and I'll leave it to your judgment whether or not we would take advantage of any human being in order to try and get any gain of any sort and I'll address myself to the remaining issues of the case which have been posed by Mr. Diamond. Now I know you're very tired, you've been very patient. This final day has been a long day so I'll speak only a few minutes. And I'll probably make one of the shortest closing arguments that's been made in this court because I think most of the issues are clear to you and I feel that you probably have an understanding of the case by now. Mr. Diamond posed in his last argument one final issue which in a sense raises a question of what we do when the need for justice is confronted by power. So let me talk to you about whether there is government fraud in this case. Now, a government is a great deal like a human being. It's not necessarily all good, and it's not necessarily all bad. We live in a good country, and I love it, and you do too. But, we have nevertheless a government which is not perfect. And there have been indications since November the 22nd of 1963, and that was not the last indication that there is excessive power in some areas of our government that the people have not received all of the truth about some of the things that have happened. Some of the assassinations that have occurred, and particularly with regard to the assassination of John Kennedy. Going back to when we were children, I think most of us, probably all of us here in this courtroom, thought that justice came into being automatically, that virtue was its own reward, and good would triumph over evil, that it occurred automatically, Later, when we found out this wasn't quite so, most of us felt that, hopefully, that at least justice occurred frequently of its own accord. But now I think that almost all of us would have to agree that there is really no automatic machinery, not on this earth at least, which causes justice to happen automatically. Men have to make it occur. Individual human beings have to make it occur. Otherwise, it doesn't come into existence. And this is not always easy. As a matter of fact, it's always hard because justice presents a threat to power. And in order to make justice come into being, you often have to fight power. Mr. Diamond raised the question, why don't we say it's a fraud and charge the government with fraud if this is the case? Well then, let me be explicit and make myself very clear on this point. The government's handling of the investigation of John Kennedy's murder was a fraud. It was the greatest fraud in the history of our country. It was probably the greatest fraud ever perpetrated in the history of humankind. So that's where I stand on that point. But that doesn't mean that we have to accept the continued existence of that kind of government which allows this to happen. We can do something about it. We're not forced to either leave this country or accept the authoritarianism that's developed which tells us that in the year 2039, we can see the evidence about what happened to John Kennedy. Government does not consist only of secret police and domestic espionage operations and generals and admirals. The government consists of people and our government consists of juries and cases of murder, whether of the poorest individual or the most distinguished citizen in the land, should be looked at openly in a court of law where juries can pass on them, not hidden, not buried like the body of a victim beneath concrete for 75 years. Now, you men in the recent weeks have heard witnesses that no one else in the world has heard, and you've seen the Zapruder film. You've seen what happened to your president. And I suggest to you that most of you know right now in that area, at least, a fraud has been perpetrated. That does not mean our government is entirely bad, and I want to emphasize that. It doesn't mean that the president is bad. It doesn't mean that the Supreme Court is bad. It does mean that in recent years, though, the development of excessive power because of the Cold War forces have developed in our government over which there is no control, and that these forces have an authoritarian approach to justice, meaning they will let you know what justice is. Well, my reply to them is we already know what it is. It is the jury system. 
In the issue which is posed by the government's conduct in concealing the evidence in this case, in the issue of humanity as opposed to power, I have chosen humanity and I will do it without any hesitation. And I hope every one of you will do the same. And I do that because I love this country and I want to communicate to the government that we will not accept unexplained assassinations with the casual information that if we live 75 years longer, we may be given more data. In this particular case, our efforts to look into it, and it was our duty when we found out that part of the assassination finally occurred in New Orleans, massive power was brought to bear to prevent justice from ever coming into this courtroom as it has. The power to make authoritative pronouncements, the power to manipulate the news media by the release of false information, the power to interfere with an honest inquiry, the power to provide an endless variety of experts to testify in behalf of power was demonstrated in this case. The American people have yet to see the Zapruda film. Why? The American people have yet to see and hear from witnesses about the assassination. Why? Because today in our government, we have a problem area in which too much emphasis has been given to secrecy with regard to the assassination of our president, and not enough emphasis has been given to the question of justice, to the question of humanity. These dignified deceptions will not suffice. We have had enough of power without truth. We don't have to accept power without truth or leave the country. I don't accept that alternative. I don't intend to leave this country, and I don't intend to accept power without truth. I intend to fight for the truth. And I suggest not only is this not un-American, but it is the most American thing we can do. Because if the truth does not endure, then our country will not endure, not in the way it was supposed to. In our country, the worst of all crimes is when the government murders truth. If it can murder truth, it can murder freedom. If it can murder freedom, it can murder your own sons, if they should dare to fight for freedom and then announce that they were killed in an industrial accident or shot by the enemy or God knows what. But in this case, finally it has been possible to bring the truth about the assassination into a court of law, not before a commission composed of important and powerful politically astute men, but before a jury of citizens. Now I suggest to you that yours is a hard duty, because in a sense what you're passing on is equivalent to a murder case. It has the same essential characteristics. And the difficult thing about passing on a murder case is that the victim is out of your sight and buried a long distance away. And all you can see is the defendant. And it's very difficult to identify with someone you can't see. And sometimes it's hard not to identify to some extent with the defendant and his problems. In that regard, every prosecutor who is at all humane is conscious of feeling sorry for the defendant in every case he prosecutes. But he is not free to forget the victim who lies buried out of sight. And I suggest to you that if you do your duty, you also are not free to forget the victim who is buried out of sight. You know, Tennyson once said that the authority forgets a dying king. This was never more true than in the murder of John Kennedy. The strange and deceptive conduct of the government after his murder began while his body was warm. And it has continued for five years. In a sense, you have even seen in this courtroom indications of the interest of some part of the government power structure in keeping the truth down, in keeping the grave closed. We present a number of eyewitnesses as well as expert witnesses, as well as the Zapruder film, to show that the fatal wound of the president came from the front. A plane landed from Washington and outstepped Dr. Fink for the defense to counter the clear and apparent evidence of a shot from the front. I don't have to go into Dr. Fink's testimony in detail for you to see that it was simply did not correspond with the facts. He admitted that he did not complete the autopsy because a general told him not to complete the autopsy. Now in this conflict between power and justice, to put it that way, just where do you think Dr. Fink stands? A general who was not a pathologist told him not to complete the autopsy, so he didn't complete it. This is the way I don't want my country to be. When our president is killed, he deserves the kind of autopsy that the ordinary citizen gets every day in the state of Louisiana. We can't have a government power suddenly interjecting itself and preventing the truth from coming to the people. But in this case, before the next morning, when the sun rose, power had moved into the situation and the truth was being concealed. And five years later in this courtroom, it's continuing in the same way. 
We presented eyewitnesses who told you of the shots coming from the grassy knoll. A plane landed from Washington and out came ballistics expert Fraser for the defense. Mr. Diamond, object to this at the court, please. Mr. Fraser was subpoenaed here as a state witness. The court. He testified for the defense. He was called by the defense, Mr. Diamond. Mr. Diamond. He was subpoenaed here from Washington as a state witness. The court. Makes no difference who was subpoenaed. It is who put him on the stand. Mr. Diamond, but we didn't have anything to do with him coming here on a plane from Washington. Mr. Garrison, now the issue I'm getting to, as I'm sure every one of you understands, is whether or not the government has created a fraud. And I call to your attention that Mr. Fraser's explanations of the sound of the shots coming from the front, which was heard by eyewitness after eyewitness after eyewitness, his explanation is that Lee Oswald created a sonic boom in his firing. Not only did Oswald break all of the world's records for markmanship, but he broke the sound barrier as well. And I suggest to you that if any of you have a shot on a firing range, and most of you probably have in the service, you were shooting rifles in which the bullet traveled faster than the speed of sound. And I ask you to recall if you have ever heard a sonic boom. If you remember when you were on the firing line and they'd say, ready on the left, ready on the right, ready on the firing line, commence firing, you heard the shots coming from the firing line to the left of you and to the right of you. And if you had heard as a result of Frazier's fictional sonic booms firing coming at you from the pits, you would have had a reaction and you would still remember. It simply doesn't exist. It's part of the fraud, a part of the government fraud. And the best way to make this country the kind of country it's supposed to be is to communicate to the government that no matter how powerful it may be, we do not accept fraud. We do not accept false announcements. We do not accept the concealment of evidence with regard to the murder of President Kennedy. Who is most believable? A Richard Randolph Carr seated here in the wheelchair and telling you what he saw and what he heard and how he was told to shut his mouth? Or Mr. Frazier with his sonic booms? Do we have to actually reject Mr. Newman and Mrs. Newman and Mr. Carr and Roger Craig and the testimony of all those honest witnesses? Reject that and accept the fraudulent Warren Commission or else leave the country? I suggest to you that there are other alternatives and one of them has been put into practice in the last month in the state of Louisiana and that is to bring out the truth in a proceeding where attorneys can cross-examine, where the defendant can be confronted by testimony against him, where the rules of evidence are applied and where a jury of citizens can pass on it and where there is no government secrecy, where you do not have evidence concealed for 75 years in the name of national security. All we have in this case are the facts. Facts which show that the defendant participated in the conspiracy to kill the president and that the president was subsequently killed in an ambush. The reply of the defense has been the same as the early reply of the government in the Warren Commission, has been authority, authority. The president's seal outside of each of the volume of the Warren Commission made necessary because there's nothing inside these volumes. Men of high position and prestige sitting on a board and announcing the results to you, but not telling you what the evidence is because that has to be hidden for 75 years. You heard in this courtroom in recent weeks, eyewitness after eyewitness after eyewitness, and above all, you saw eyewitness which was indifferent to power, the Zapruder film. The lens of the camera is indifferent to power and tells what happened. And that is one of the reasons 200 million Americans have not seen the Zapruder film. Should have seen it many times. They should know exactly what happened. They should know what you know now. Why hasn't this come into being if there hasn't been government fraud? Of course there has. But I'm telling you that I think we can do something about it. I think that there's still enough Americans left in this country to make it continue to be America. I think that we can still fight authoritarianism, the government's insistence on secrecy, government force used in the counterattacks against an honest inquiry. And when we do that, we're not being un-American, we're being American because it isn't easy and you're sticking your neck out in a rather permanent way but it has to be done because truth does not come into being automatically justice does not happen automatically individual men like the members of my staff here have to work and fight to make it happen and individual men like you have to make justice come into being because otherwise it doesn't happen 
And what I'm trying to tell you is that there are forces in America today, unfortunately, which are not in favor of the truth coming out about John Kennedy's assassination. As long as our government continues to be like that, and as long as such forces can get away with these kinds of actions, then this is no longer the country in which we were born. The murder of John Kennedy was probably the most terrible moment in the history of our country. Yet circumstances have placed you in the position where not only have you seen the hidden evidence, but you are actually going to have the opportunity to bring justice into the picture for the first time. Now, you are sitting in judgment on Clay Shaw, but you as men represent more than jurors in an ordinary case because of the victim in this case. You represent, in some sense, a hope of humanity against government power. You represent humanity which may triumph over excessive government power if you will cause it to be so in the course of doing your duty in this case. I suggest that you ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. What can you do for your country? You can cause justice to happen for the first time in this matter. You can help make our country better by showing that this is still a government of the people. And if you do that, as long as you live, nothing will ever be more important than that. Thank you. Jim Garrison's closing argument, March 5th, 1969. Clay Shaw trial.